Insecticides in general are a regular component of many pest management systems. They are fast acting and highly effective, allowing producers to treat a pest problem while it's happening. Insecticide application, therefore, helps to maintain the quantity and quality of our food and fiber production and mitigates economic losses in these areas. In addition to being highly effective, some insecticides have been designed to complement modern agricultural methods. They are easy to apply and economical in terms of cost savings from reduced pest damage. Nevertheless, there are some long-term problems associated with insecticide application, which we'll learn about in this lesson. The release of harmful chemicals into the environment can cause a variety of problems, including detrimental effects on non-target organisms and health risks to applicators and consumers. Non-target effects occur because many insecticides are considered broad spectrum in that they affect many types of insects. Insecticides impact not only the target insect pest, but also populations of beneficial insects like pollinators and natural enemies of the pests. As we have discussed in several sections of the course so far, insecticide poisoning of non-target organisms can have substantial effects on ecological health and can disrupt the balance of the managed ecosystem. We have discussed in detail how pollinators can be killed by certain insecticides as can predatory beneficial insects like lacewings and ladybird beetles. Insecticides that end up in water systems can kill aquatic arthropods and neurotoxins can also harm fish and amphibians. Terrestrial mammals and birds can also be poisoned by certain classes of insecticides, mainly the neurotoxins and broad spectrum insecticides. A lot of research and testing goes into assessing the toxicity of an insecticide. On every insecticide label, there are clear warnings of what the toxicity of the chemical is to a user, including the relative toxicity to different organisms, potential health effects, and preventative measures. Simple considerations like minimizing personal exposure by wearing gloves, long sleeves and pants, and washing hands after use go a long way in protecting an applicator from the dangers of insecticides. Despite these warnings, insecticides cause the highest number of pesticide poisonings in the United States each year. Sometimes, despite all efforts, label warnings are not followed, and those who apply insecticides are at increased risk for pesticide poisoning. Compared with pesticide applicators, consumers have the lowest potential exposure to insecticides. A 2017 report by the European Food Safety Authority found that 97% of sampled food products from around the EU were within the permitted EU limits for insecticide residue and essentially pesticide free. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and in Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, work to reduce the risk of pesticide residues on consumable foods and set strict standards that must be followed by producers in North America and from other countries who want to export their food into North America. Preventing the release of pesticides into the environment can be a challenging task for many producers. There are specific guidelines designed to minimize environmental contamination with most aspects of insecticide application, and these should be followed as closely as possible. These guidelines include factors such as the nozzle size that sprayers should have to maximize the amount of insecticide that lands on the crop, and minimize the amount that gets blown away. The specific doses of insecticide to maximize pest control and minimize non-target effects. Guidelines on the time of day that the insecticide should be applied to avoid pollinators. 
and at what crop stage the insecticide can be safely applied so that it does not leave residues on the consumable part of the crop. One common issue is that many chemical products lack clear guidelines as to how crop residue containing pesticides and other pesticide contaminated material should be disposed of by producers. In recent years, the use of biobed installations to break down pesticide residues has become increasingly popular. A biobed is an area, typically a dugout pit, that is intended to be a site for dumping pesticide contaminated waste. A biobed is filled with a mixture of straw, compost, and soil that provides an excellent environment for microbes that break down pesticide residues. The biobed must be constructed as a closed system with an impermeable liner so that excess water is not leached into the environment, but is instead circulated within the biobed. Canadian research has shown that biobeds can break down about 90% of pesticides introduced into the system. The resulting mix can eventually be spread onto the field as a fertilizer. The uninhibited use of chemical insecticides can result in damaging long-term effects, known as the three R's, pest resurgence, replacement, and resistance. Pest resurgence is the rebound of a pest population to higher densities than before the insecticide was applied. Resurgence occurs most often with the use of broad-spectrum insecticides, which kill natural enemies that would otherwise attack the pest populations. Without these natural enemies, surviving pest populations can rebound and reach economically damaging levels. Populations of natural enemies, on the other hand, will vary depending on the number of pests and take longer to recover. Pest resurgence is something that has been observed in rice cultivation. Brown plant hoppers, which feed on rice plants, are common pests in tropical Asia. In the 1980s, large scale outbreaks of this pest began to occur in rice plantations around the continent. The cause was found to be excessive insecticide use which had killed off the natural enemies of the plant hoppers, such as spiders and ladybird beetles, allowing the pest populations to rebound to even more injurious levels. Replacement, or secondary pest outbreaks, occurs under similar conditions as pest resurgence, where a broad spectrum insecticide kills off natural enemies of the target pest and other insects in the system. Insects that are normally under natural control by predators or parasitoids and not considered to be pests in the managed ecosystem can be released from natural control through the application of broad spectrum insecticides. These insects become pests as a result of insecticide application. These new pests can become just as serious of a problem as the initial pest for which the insecticide was applied. For instance, before the application of synthetic organic pesticides, such as pyrethroids, became widespread in agricultural practices, spider mites were considered insignificant crop pests. However, as these chemicals became widely used to control pests like thrips, they also eliminated populations of non-target predatory arthropods that kept the spider mite populations under control. With the loss of these natural enemies, spider mite populations began to soar out of control, turning them into the major horticultural pests they are today. The largest problem with insecticide application and the most important of the three R's is pest resistance. Resistance refers to the reduction in the sensitivity of a pest population to a particular method of control, usually pesticides. 
Just as bacterial pathogens of humans can become resistant to antibiotics if overused, more than 500 species of insects and mites have built up resistance to pesticides. Examples of problematic pests that have developed resistance to multiple insecticides include the diamondback moth, a pest of brassica crops like cabbage and canola, Colorado potato beetle, an important defoliator of potato and some other solanaceous crops, and the polyphagous green peach aphid that is a pest of many different crops. Resistance is a genetic phenomenon that arises through natural selection. It can evolve any time a selective pressure is applied. In this case, the selective pressure is insecticide application. The natural variation that exists in a pest population means that even when an effective insecticide is applied, a subset of the population may have mutations which resist poisoning by the insecticide. These individuals can survive and reproduce, passing on the advantageous mutation. Selection over several generations of the same kind of insecticide being applied to the pests can result in an increase in the relative number of individuals in the population with the gene or genes coding for resistance. Eventually, the whole population could be resistant to the insecticide. In that case, the control method would no longer be effective and application of that insecticide would be a waste of time and money. A current example of the development of insecticide resistance is occurring in mosquito vectors of malaria, the genus Anopheles. In 2012, the World Health Organization, WHO, issued a global plan for insecticide resistance management in malaria vectors based on the fact that resistance has been demonstrated in all mosquito vectors of malaria to all four recommended classes of insecticides. The plan calls for the development of resistance management strategies, resistance monitoring, and increased resources to develop solutions. This is important because if this trend continues, there will be a significant increase in malaria mortality rates. The mechanism by which insects develop resistance to insecticides can vary depending on the insect and the type of insecticide. Behavioral resistance occurs when a pest modifies its behavior to decrease its exposure to a toxin. Insects may recognize and learn to avoid a toxin that is present in an insecticide, the same way that they can move away from or be repelled by naturally toxic plants. Avoidance may come from simple behaviors, such as termination of feeding. The insects may also avoid sprayed surfaces by moving to less susceptible areas of the plant, such as the underside of the leaves or further into the crop where sprays may not effectively reach. Behavioral resistance can be difficult to determine, and most examples are based on observational data. There is a lack of genetic data that would prove that behavioral resistance has evolved into a heritable trait in response to specific toxins. Instead, it is often tied to some kind of physiological resistance. Adult females searching for a place to oviposit can avoid leaves that have been treated with insecticides, as has been shown in diamondback moths. Similarly, some species of caterpillars feed more slowly on insecticide-treated plants than untreated plants in order to provide more time for the detoxification of the chemicals. While these examples are not necessarily examples of pure behavioral resistance, they do demonstrate the ability of insects to modify their behavior in response to insecticide treatments. Other types of resistance are physiological, meaning that the insect has developed some kind of internal mechanism to handle the insecticide so that it is no longer toxic. Metabolic resistance occurs when a poison is detoxified or destroyed by enzymes before it can reach the target site in the insect. This is the most common mechanism of resistance. 
most herbivorous insects have some ability to detoxify poisons due to their long history of coevolution with plant hosts. However, resistant individuals within a population may detoxify poisons more efficiently than their non-resistant counterparts. Individuals may also become metabolically resistant if they are able to excrete the toxins with the rest of their waste. Some species of insects can also shift harmful toxins into the exocuticle so that the toxins are shed with the next molt, which is a form of physiological resistance. Altered target site resistance occurs when a mutation at the target site of the insecticide renders the poison ineffective. For example, the receptors to which the insecticide binds may become less receptive to the insecticide. This can even occur with pesticides that mimic insect hormones. While you may think resistance to hormone analogs would be difficult to develop because hormones are necessary for survival, this adaptation has actually been documented in some wild populations of mosquitoes. After several decades of exposure to a formulation of methoprene, a juvenile hormone analog, these mosquito populations were extremely resistant to the once effective insecticide. Studies indicated that the hormone analog was not being degraded by enzymes, so one potential mechanism for this resistance is an altered target site. Altered target site resistance to juvenile hormone analogs has been demonstrated in a species of housefly and in genetically mutated fruit flies in the lab. So this mechanism may also be used by the mosquitoes. An altered target site is the second most common type of resistance. Penetration resistance is another mechanism of insecticide resistance. Penetration resistance, just as the name sounds, involves adaptations which reduce the ability of insecticides to penetrate the exoskeleton. Penetration resistance is often present in conjunction with other forms of resistance and can make other mechanisms of resistance more effective. Lastly, cross-resistance occurs when the development of resistance to one poison allows an organism to resist other poisons and is especially likely to occur if these toxins share similar modes of action. For example, some houseflies evolved resistance to DDT when it was widely used. As a result, these populations of houseflies are now resistant to other types of axonic poisons, such as the synthetic pyrethroids. Certain biological qualities in the pest species can promote the evolution of resistance. For instance, insects that are concentrated in space and use a limited range of resources with little dispersal tend to face greater selective pressures from insecticide application due to greater exposure. Similarly, if a pest species has a short generation time or large numbers of offspring, there is a higher likelihood that the population will evolve resistance. High numbers of offspring increase the chances for random mutations that promote resistance, as there are more individuals in the population. These mutations can become dominant in the population quickly if generation times are short. In addition to biological factors, the rates at which pests develop insecticide resistance also depend on the type of chemical and how it is applied. These are known as operational factors. For instance, if pest managers set low economic thresholds, they are likely to apply pesticides more frequently. Increased exposure to insecticidal toxins will lead to greater pest mortality but it can also increase selection pressure on the target pests, which in turn promotes the evolution of resistance. Similarly, the timing of chemical application can have an effect on the development of resistance. 
The application of chemicals before mating occurs, for example, can promote resistance. This is because only resistant individuals will survive the treatment to successfully produce offspring, potentially passing on their resistance gene and creating a new generation of resistant individuals. The type of insecticide applied can also be an important factor in the development of resistance. For example, if the pesticide is a chemical that is irritating or repellent to the insects, the insects may learn to avoid it, thus forming a behavioral resistance. The evolution of pesticide resistance is estimated to cost more than $1.4 billion annually in the U.S. alone. Organisms can often evolve resistance to pesticides and other control methods faster than we can develop them. While it is difficult to manage biological factors that promote chemical resistance in pests, we can endeavor to manipulate operational factors to minimize the evolution of resistance. The best way to combat the evolution of insecticide resistance is to employ an integrated pest management system that does not solely depend on insecticides for management of the target pest. When possible, it is important to employ passive approaches, which we will discuss in the next module, as they can reduce the selective pressures applied to pest populations. Alternating the application of insecticides with different modes of action is a key global strategy currently used to try and slow down the development of pesticide resistance in insects. One effective way to slow down the development of insecticide resistance is to provide a refuge for a pest species. This can be done by keeping specific areas of a crop pesticide free, which provides an area where susceptible insects can develop without exposure to the insecticide. Surviving resistant individuals from the insecticide sprayed area can then mate with individuals that have not been exposed to the pesticide to maintain susceptible genotypes in the population. Refuge strategies are currently used in the management of a major moth pest of cotton, the cotton bollworm, Helicoverpa armigera, in China, where Bt cotton is a major crop, and growers want to minimize the chance for this pest to develop resistance to Bt. Currently, the strategy seems to be working, and this pest continues to be susceptible to the Bt insecticidal toxin. Rotating control tactics and employing passive approaches are components of IPM that aim to mitigate the development of resistance in pest populations. Let's find out how this works in the next lesson. Before we move on, and now that you are familiar with the risks associated with the use of insecticides, let's hear more from our expert, Mike Jenkins, about control programs used in the city of Edmonton. Yeah, um, in particular, uh Back in the 80s, one of the major pests in Edmonton uh, was uh, birch leaf miner. Uh, this was a largely cosmetic pest that affected uh, birch trees all across the city, uh, created these uh, brownish patches on the leaves, it looked almost like uh, crispy cornflakes of a little uh, uh, wasp larva that was actually living inside the leaf. And uh, homeowners in Edmonton used to uh, dump hundreds of, maybe thousands of liters of dimethoate. Um, which is a pretty nasty uh, nerve agent, uh, broad spectrum pesticide. Uh, uh, they use it as a soil drench to get into the, the birch trees to try to kill off these uh, insects. Uh, but fortunately, in the early 90s, a little parasitic wasp called Lathrolestes luteolator moved in and started uh, parasitizing those birch leaf miners. And uh, they were able to build up a large enough population that they largely took care of the birch leaf miner. Um, we've had minor outbreaks since then, uh, but um, even when we do start getting the uh, birch leaf miner returning, uh, the parasitic wasps return uh, fairly quickly afterwards as well. And uh, essentially, uh, 
eliminated the need for that dimethylate use. We've looked at insects that could potentially help control uh, weed species from Canada thistle and scentless chamomile, um, a bunch of those ones. The ones that have been most successful have been on yellow toad flax. Um, is one of them, uh, we've ha there's a little weevil called Mesinus uh, that uh, has actually done quite well. Again, it doesn't completely eliminate uh, these weeds, but it keeps the, the population uh, much, much lower and uh, basically keeps it from taking over entire slopes. So public education is a very important part of what we do with the pest lab. Um, in particular, if we can get out there and uh, get more eyes out there monitoring for some of these invasive species, knowing what those signs and symptoms are, the better chance we have of actually detecting something uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, so that's a really important component. Uh, but another important part is our overall goal to basically reduce pesticide use in the city. A uh, lot of homeowner usage of pesticides is uh, used uh, domestic uh, products that are used against spiders and things like that in the homes that really don't need to be controlled. So if we can uh, better educate people about the benefits of most of the insects that are in your backyard and even in your home and uh, reduce the amount of uh, pesticide that's used that way, um, that's going to be a huge reduction in the overall usage of pesticides in the city as well as the uh, exposure to the public of a lot of these pesticides. So that's another uh, major goal of our public education programs. So we have about 30 or so different species of mosquito that are fairly common in the Edmonton area, but there's really only a handful of those that are really major uh, uh, biting nuisance species. And our program is geared specifically for pretty much just three species. Um, so there's Ochlerotatus spencerii and Ochlerotatus dorsalis. Uh, they're fairly early spring species and they're very aggressive daytime biters. Um, so we target those ones in particular. If you can uh, reduce their population early in their, the spring, uh, they get less chance to build up to really large numbers come summertime. Uh, but once we get into the summer, our main species is called Aedes vexans, uh, also known as the floodwater mosquito. And once we get into uh, uh, late June and July, that mosquito makes up probably 99% of our entire mosquito population. So it's the major one we think of as our main mosquito in the Edmonton area. It's uh, mostly active at dawn and dusk. It's a sneaky little ankle biter, gets in there and uh, uh, gets you while you're sitting in the patio before you even realize you've been bit. Um, and so that is the major focus of our program. The City of Edmonton's program focuses on controlling the larval uh, aquatic stage of the mosquito. Uh, so we use uh, larvicides, essentially, uh, when we've uh, reached that threshold that there's enough hatching going on out there, um, we actually head out into the areas where the, the temporary pools are, uh, both in uh, field conditions and along roadsides are the, the two sites where we find most of those. And we actually treat that with the larvicide and try to reduce the number of larvae um, that will then, of course, uh, become adults. One of it is uh, source reduction. So if there is an area where uh, water is collecting and is becoming a mosquito habitat, um, doing some landscaping to fill that in so it's no longer uh, mosquito development habitat can really help out, um, but uh, I would recommend that that only happen on those very temporary ponds, on uh, more uh, semi-permanent and especially permanent ponds that don't typically produce mosquitoes. Uh, you would not want to reduce those. Those are important wetland habitats for a lot of other species. Um, th these, this would just be the, the shallow depressions that just keep water for about a week or so. Um, so that'd be the most important one. Uh, in backyards, in some areas where you have uh, container developing mosquitoes, it can be very important to dump out bird baths, uh, empty uh, 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 rain barrels, or uh, make sure they have a screen on them, uh, things along those lines. Um, that's not as important in the Edmonton area where we don't have that many of the container developing mosquitoes, but it's extremely important in a lot of other areas. Hopefully this module has given you a deeper understanding of the benefits and costs associated with the use of insecticides. These concepts will be important to keep in mind in the future for the final ILO in which you will need to use your knowledge of IPM to design an economical and eco-friendly pest management program for an orchard.